Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Naomi Berkshine. I'm the Executive Director of Harm Reduction International. Um, as you know, Harm Reduction International hosts the conference here, and I'm happy to welcome you all to the conference and to Portugal. Um, this is our opening conference, our, our official opening press conference, and we hope today to give you a small snapshot of what you can expect to hear tonight in the opening ceremony. This press conference is being streamed live um, on our conference website. Before I introduce my esteemed colleagues sitting with me here today, <clears throat> let me briefly touch on a few points to set the scene for today and the rest of the week. We're deeply privileged to be here today in Portugal to learn about the health advances made under the Portuguese decriminalization model. Of course, there's room for continued progress, but we must recognize the world still looks to the reforms that Portugal made 20 years ago. We're delighted to have worked with leaders in Portugal to create this opportunity for exposure to the Portuguese model. I understand uh, many of you took a field trip yesterday uh, and it was a success. I'd like to particularly thank Abdesh and Kasso uh, for providing our media delegates with such a special opportunity. Um, it's a strong start and we're really looking forward to being with you here this week in Portugal. Um, but of course, as I alluded to, it's not all good news and sadly we're we have advanced, many governments and decision makers continue to sit on their hands. Uh, there's been some strong progress in the past three decades, both in terms of governments providing harm reduction services and open political support for health-based, rights-based approach to drugs. Uh, but in many cases, governments do remain gripped by complacency uh, and are failing to keep up with what is actually required. Globally, the availability of harm reduction services has stagnated, and we see this in particular over the past four years. Uh, harm reduction at a government and national level is failing to adapt to new trends in drug use and overdose deaths, which are at crisis level in some parts of Europe, North America, and Canada. Globally, 99% of the population of people who inject drugs face limited or no coverage of harm reduction services, and we know that injection use is just part of the broader picture. Worst of all, and possibly not surprisingly, there's little money being committed to address this. There's a nearly 90% shortfall in funding for harm reduction services in low and middle income countries. And in the face of all of this, governments continue to spend billions of dollars on law enforcement and punitive drug control. Internationally, we're seeing some particularly brutal and violent expressions of the war on drugs, the Philippines being the most egregious example. In 2008, a human rights organization in Bangladesh reported 292 deaths associated with a crackdown on the war on drugs. And we're deeply concerned that there's going to be a mimic effect from the Philippines. So where now for the harm reduction movement? In the first instance, I think this conference continues the important recognition that drug policy, public health, and human rights are inextricably interlinked. And that we need to continue to call for political commitment and for funding in order to mount an effective response. Secondly, as we'll see this week, we need to keep reaffirming the bank of scientific evidence that supports key harm reduction interventions, such as drug checking, safe injection sites, and opiate substitution treatment. In the US, we've had an overdose crisis that's now killing more people than AIDS did in the same country at the height of the crisis in the 1990s. And we cannot end that without harm reduction. We cannot end it until drug checking and consumption rooms are a non-exceptional everyday part of public health policy. So, before I turn over to my esteemed speakers, a bit of housekeeping. We'll be hearing three to four minutes brief remarks from each of our speakers, and then I'll open the floor for your questions. Once the press conference has ended, you're welcome to approach our speakers to arrange a one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, so let's begin. Uh, our first speaker is Jose Queiroz, the executive director of APDESH, uh, and our local conference partners. Uh, I welcome Jose's reflection on what this conference means to the harm reduction community here in Porto and more widely in Portugal. Uh, thank you. I'd like to welcome our, our fourth speaker, Rui Quimbras, uh, from CASA. So, um, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, Naomi, for your nice words and for your speech. Um, actually, I was with some of you two days ago, so it will be a little, a little bit strange to repeat some of my sentences, but still, when I you know, think about the name of this conference, the title People Before Politics, what it came to my mind <clears throat> is this, this idea that our decriminalization model was based on relationship, was based on participation, 
and was-based in creating a common ground between people, between different stakeholders, between professionals, between drug users, between agents from law enforcement, between politicians, between researchers. And I truly tr believe that this was making the difference on those times 20 years ago when some uh, political actors in Portugal call um, a group of experts to design our decolonization model. And actually, one of the greatest things on the work that this group has, has done, and we have João Galão, who was one of the members of this group, was <clears throat> the idea to design a new law based on evidence-based, but also based on the knowledge that was already out, out, out there, the, based on the good political models that we could see on those times in the Netherlands, for example, or in Switzerland, even in some parts of the UK, for example. And also, it was you know, based on the idea of pragmatism and humanism. And, of course, one of the things that, for me, that somehow creates a different narrative on that period was the idea that people should be called to design also the law. And <clears throat> that's why the idea of participation was so important when the national strategy was built up. Saying this, I need to say that harm reduction in Portugal, but harm reduction everywhere, is based on these same principles of pragmatism, humanism, participation, inclusion. And that's why harm reduction works so well in Portugal. And that's why harm reduction is a fundamental pillar of our decolonization model in our country. Because, and this is the pillar that actually has created a huge resistance, a huge um, combat action that defended the model during the period of austerity. So when even Portugal was facing a huge crisis from the financial point of view, when we were facing unemployment once again, when professionals of harm reduction were being you know, put out of the teams, when the money was not, was not coming, the people from harm reduction, professional and peers, they were resisting and they were still working. Meaning with that, that maybe one of the most important things for people working in harm reduction in Portugal is the belief on a dialogical model that is upon them, but, f but mainly is the belief on the people. And that's why our conference has the name The People Before Politics, because it's the people who makes the politics, it's the people that are the pillar for decolonization in Portugal, and it is the people that are, you know, the pillar of harm reduction and community progress and development. Um. Thank you, Jose. Our next speaker needs no introduction. Joao Goulao is the current Director General of the General Directorate for Intervention on Addictive Behaviours and Dependencies, also known as CCAD. But Joao, as most of you know, has been in many ways the official public face of Portugal drug policy over the years and is an often quoted drug czar. Joao. Thank you. Thank you, Joao. Thank you, Jose. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, in fact, as Jose said, arm production is a crucial part of our policies, of our drugs policies. The so-called Portuguese model is mostly known everywhere, uh, about the, the decision on the crime. Uh, and of course, it is a very, very important decision that was taken 20 years ago. It was published. Uh, on the 20, 22nd of April of 99, the, the strategy that included decriminalization. But in fact, our policies stand in several mission areas, such as prevention, treatment, supplying treatment to, to all those uh, in need of it, uh, reintegration policies, and mostly on arm reduction policies. This is crucial and this is the, the, the main, the, this is the, the main uh, source, the main, main cause that led us to the progresses that we achieved during the last 20 years. Uh, so, hosting 
a big international conference on arm reduction here in Portugal, the city of Porto, and we are happy to be, to have been invited to participate and to take uh, uh, an important role on, on it. So I'm very thankful to Arm Reduction International and to APRES. Uh, it's, it's for us uh, very important because we have an experience to share not only on the, on the green, which I insist is a very important part of our policies, but in all those integrated uh, parts of the integrated policy that we have uh, been uh, putting in place. So, uh, we will take the opportunity to, to share some views. We already had uh, yesterday in the policy day and uh, this morning with the Portuguese-speaking countries uh, launching the basis for a more active participation and a more active sharing of experiences uh, in order to, to lead people to a more humane and pragmatic approaches to the drugs problems. So, thank you. Thank you, John. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce our next speaker, Ricardo Baptista Leche. Ricardo is a Portuguese MP and president and founder of the UNITE Network of Global Parliamentarians. UNITE is a non-profit, non-partisan global network of parliamentarians from state, national and regional parliaments committed to eliminating HIV and AIDS, viral hepatitis and other infectious diseases as public health threats by 2030. Thank you, Ricardo. Thank you, Naomi. And uh, boa tarde, good afternoon and welcome to Porto. It's uh, with great pleasure that uh, we welcome you here uh, as a physician, as a member of parliament, uh, as a researcher. I couldn't be happier to endorse the efforts towards pushing for harm reduction and decriminalization in a people-centered public health approach, as it is a cost-effective, evidence-based, data-based initiative that has saved lives in our country. I must say, as Naomi has mentioned, that uh, I am here as president of UNITE, a global network of parliamentarians that are committed to ending infectious diseases as a global health threat. And when the opportunity came about to join efforts with Harm Reduction International and APDES uh, in partnering and supporting uh, the Harm Reduction International Conference in Porto, we did not hesitate one second. We found that uh, there was openness to discuss policy in an open manner, and we used that opportunity very shamelessly. We organized a pre-conference uh, along with APDES and, uh, and Harm Reduction International, and also in Sioux, and we organized what we called a Joint Action Policy Day yesterday. And the main focus was to bring together parliamentarians from around the world uh, along with the scientific community, civil society, and media to be able to discuss these issues and to look at the evidence not only from Portugal but beyond. What is working, what is not, and what we need to do uh, better. UNITE is uh, a network, as I mentioned, and as Naomi also mentioned, it's a non-profit, non-partisan NGO that has the main focus of bringing together parliamentarians so that we can push parliamentarians in the direction of pushing for the concrete uh, policies that are needed, changing budgets when, where they are needed, and making sure that they raise awareness when needed. And we do that working along with uh, civil society and community-based organizations. We do it along with uh, media and communication specialists, and we do that along with the scientific community. It is working with all of these different uh, pillars for transformation that we are capable of promoting change globally. We believe that uh, coming from uh, the global health sector, drug policy is a fundamental angle to be able to end stigma and discrimination, especially when we're talking about bloodborne infections such as HIV, AIDS, and viral hepatitis. And it has been shown, and the Portuguese model is a clear example in that direction, that good policies can save lives. And that is, I think, one of the most important messages that we can take out of Portugal. And of course, there is always room to move forward. But as a parliamentarian, and I'll end on this note, 
I'll leave you with this example. 20 years ago, when we were seen as an, exper as an, an as experiment, now we are not an experiment anymore, we are a proven experience. But 20 years ago, not all of Parliament was in favor of decriminalization. Today, 20 years later, after millions of lives have been saved, after social calm has been recalled, after crime has gone down, after showing the successes of having a people-centered public health approach, 20 years after decriminalization was approved with part of the support of the parliament, if we were to pass the bill today, we would have unanimous support from all parties. And I can say this from the experience of working with my colleagues from different parties in parliament, through the acknowledgement of the social impact and the, the, the consensus that was generated through our actions and through the enormous work that has been done over these last two decades under the leadership of João Golão and so many uh, people in the civil society movements that have been able to transform, have this transformative change in our society. And I guess that is the most impactful message I can leave you and I'm open to questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Um, finally, I'm really pleased to introduce Rui Coimbras Moreira uh, from CASO, which loosely translates to Consumers Survive Together, the local organization of people who use drugs. Um, Rui will provide us with a community perspective and, uh, and his vision for the future. And uh, this has been... Uh, uh, Amazing days, uh, having all this uh, energy of uh, people fighting for for better conditions for for people. Well, it's the, the it, it has been 45 years since we are in a democratic uh, country, and we are uh, civil society still in development, not a very strong civil society. Um, well, the model is uh, is uh, as brought, uh, and if uh, from our opinion, from the drug users' opinion, view, uh, the strategy, the, the national strategy, is still today a fantastic, a brilliant document. is translated in English, and is still actual, in fact. Uh, but since the, the financial crisis, I think that somehow uh, lots of players have to, to reread it again. Uh, we had a, a proposed biopsychosocial bio approach. We had this complex model, these integrated uh, centers with uh, answers that were multisectoral, not only from clinic, but different sectors, training, uh, employment, uh, housing, and uh, well, with the financial crisis and since 2008, more or less, things have uh, stopped evolving. Um, we've seen that, and afterwards in 2011, due to the crisis, in fact, it was really a blind cut to dismantle the institute that gave uh, uh, cohesion to the different parts and sectors that uh, um, uh, were intervening in this area. Um, CASO exists since 2008 as an informal group, so we began our work in the moment the model stopped to evolve, more or less. Um, so we see that uh, lots, of lots of numbers and uh, indicators have gone much better. We see uh, HIV numbers, uh, contagious, everything is gone for better, but this created a kind of invisibility around uh, users and uh, um, there are still lots of places where users are leaving the same war that they were living in the 80s and in the 90s. This year uh, we were uh, working in, uh, we have projects in the neighborhoods, we had trained the people from the neighborhoods to, to develop their own projects because they're the ones who know. The peers and the, the people that are there, they're the one, uh, they're the first ones, when there's an OD, they're the first ones to be there. Um, and in fact, we had a guy that died 20 meters away from us 
in an abandoned school uh, with lots of users, with lots of uh, homeless people, with lots of sex workers associated with use. And uh, so we still feel that, however, the quantity, the numbers have gone down. Uh, in fact, the intensity and uh, the, the lives of people that uh, um, are on this front line of the war are still very miserable and uh, uh, somehow state can't reach them. Uh, well, the role we've been having is more or less to complement the, the, the state and to build the bridge between the outreach teams and these places where uh, people use so this uh, well uh, more more degraded spaces and lives. Uh, so we don't uh, want these people to be forgotten. No one should be left behind. And but uh, we feel that so many speeches are being made about inclusion and all this uh, uh, round uh, speech that we want to bring some kind of reality into these uh, issues. And this situation still happen every day. So each day we are not uh, in the correct place. There's another HCV, there's another uh, guy sharing material, then he goes home and so on and so on. Um, we think that uh, this part of the most week should be reinforced and, uh, well, uh, the model, in fact, with the crisis, wasn't, uh, was underinvested, and uh, the, this area of harm reduction was underinvested for 20 years. Even this is a pillar of the Portuguese model, like prevention or treatment. But this pillar uh, has been uh, uh, mostly um, uh, developed by civil society NGOs. Uh, not funded 100% uh, in a scheme of pilot projects that lasted for 14 years. And it's more than time that uh, the, the, this kind of intervention, being a pillar of the model, becomes a program, becomes a service, something like this. Also, in this field of harm reduction, the, the, the peers can go, and uh, we hear a lot, we have to work with uh, hard-to-reach uh, populations and uh, harder-to-reach populations. And these are the, I smile because these are the guys we're with them daily, and uh, for us, they're not so hard to reach. Um, this should be recognized not as uh, voluntary, uh, non-paid uh, uh, work. This should be uh, developed to a, a, a profession or to a, um, a role in every outreach team or to, uh, so that the model can be also translated to reality. So, so welcome to, to this meeting and uh, I just wanted to, to bring reality also Portuguese reality to, to the table. However, I have to say that I'm very grateful <laughs> to live in Portugal and with this model because uh, lots of places I go to, uh, well, decriminalization should be the first step of lots of other investments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rui. Um, now I'd like to open the floor for questions. We don't have a roving mic today, so if you could just speak quite loudly. Um, to get your questions out, uh, and when I call on you, it would be great if you could start by stating your name and the outlet that you're from, and uh, tell me who you'd like to direct the question to. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. Should we take one or two other questions and then turn to the panel? 
Thanks. Thank you. And the third question? Great, let's start with those two. So we've got a question about how Portugal plans to continue to lead um, and about uh, perspectives on an overly medicalized approach. Well, I think it's mostly up to me to, to respond. Uh, as to the, to the new ways to address the problems, such as uh, safe injecting sites. Uh, in fact, they, uh, those spaces are uh, possible according with our law since 2001. Okay. Uh, in 2001, we passed a, a, a law uh, that uh, uh, Makes, uh, made possible a, a lot of, of uh, harm reduction approaches, including this one. But uh, political negotiation at the time led us to include in the law the principle that we should have the agreement of the municipality and the central government to open those sites as a, as a, a pilot, uh, not a, as a stable response, but a, at a, as a pilot process. And the years following that approval, uh, we could not reach the consensus between the municipality and the central government. When finally, some almost 10 years later, we reached that we had political conditions to, to do it in Lisbon, when we went to the ground to the people working in harm reduction in the uh, close to, to the people, what was told to us was, okay, not now, because injecting drug use is dropping so fast, there's that opening, a safe, safe injecting room uh, right now is completely against the mainstream, against the tendency, and it's probably a wrong sign to give to the society. That's why, that's why we stopped at the moment. At the time, uh, the, the prevalence of injecting drug use was around 3% of drug users. Then we had changes. As uh, Rui said, the social and, and uh, the, the financial and social crisis came and we, have, we had a rebound on injecting drug use, mostly from ancient heroin users. And that's the case, and since then we have been trying again to open safe injecting sites. And it happened last week in Lisbon. For the first time we have the first, we have the first safe injecting site, a mobile one, circulating in the streets of Lisbon. And in the near future, I hope next month probably, we will have two fixed sites in Lisbon. And we had today the commitment of the deputy mayor of the Porto uh, municipality, uh, stating that he is also available, the municipality of Porto is also available to study and to endorse uh, a proposal of, a, of a, a consortium of NGOs that presented a proposal to, uh, to the municipality. So I think the next step is shortly uh, we will have two more sites in Lisbon and I hope perhaps during this year uh, one site uh, at least in, in Porto. As to the taking the lead into legalization of cannabis or whatever. In fact, as Ricardo said, uh, uh, the political will when we passed the law of decriminalization, there was a clear division on the parliament. Okay? So, Parties supporting the idea, others opposing it, more conservative opposing it. Nowadays, we have a consensus about our drugs policies. 
And in fact, everybody, every, all the political parties seem to be quite, uh, quite uh, happy with the status that, that we have. Last, last year, we had an initiative uh, from uh, one of the parties to pass the medical cannabis that was approved. And shortly after, a, a new proposal came to pass social use of cannabis. That was not even admitted for a discussion in, in plenary. But I believe this is also due to the political context. We are approaching elections. We will have elections next October. And probably that's why nobody is stepping uh, forward. In any case, I believe that decriminalization was a decision that was taken when we were facing a devastating situ situation in Portugal. Nowadays, even if we have, of course we have, we did not solve our drugs problems, all of them, we still face uh, new problems. But I believe that we have the tools to uh, fine-tune uh, and to, uh, to, in those new targets. Uh, so I think we do not need a further uh, legislative step uh, as uh, uh, completely necessary to, uh, to address those new, those new challenges. And the official position of Portugal is, okay, there are some experiences going on in other places. That's the case of Uruguay, that's the case in Canada, very recent experiences. Let's wait for the evidence to come from those experiences and then we will decide if we move or not into that direction. Okay? So this is where we stand concerning this, uh, this thing. This, this was a lot. Uh, okay. 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 Um, just to say that I disagree a little bit with our friend João Galão, and I think that Portugal actually, you know, has a kind of moral duty and a moral res responsibility to go further in this, you know, in this law. So. Decriminalization has more or less 20 years, or has already 20 years. It was quite progressive in some way because it was, yeah, it was progressive and not so progressive actually. Because as you can see, there were a lot, there were, there were a lot of, not a lot, but there were some decriminalization laws already in this planet when our law came and was set up. <clears throat> there was also harm reduction as a strategy and as a myth mythology to work on the field that actually has came up and appear in the Liverpool, in U UK, Amsterdam, and, and, and in the Netherlands. So, but I think to do the creative approach of Portugal on those days was the perfect combination between the law and the practices. It was the idea that we, would, we should be capable to have a progressive law that open uh, the opportunities to go further from criminalization to health, as Joan was saying, and putting people in the center of this process. Of course, there was something, there was a kind of tricky thing on this that was the idea that the person was not seen as a criminal anymore, but starting to be seen as a sick person and to be caught in this concept of sickness and, and illness. Um, but at the same time that the person, the citizen, was appearing with, an, with our law, harm reduction structure on the field start to work in a very, in a very, sorry, it's not running well, it's not, sorry, uh, can I have uh, the opportunity because it's not, it's not what I mean. So my point is, we have decriminalization, we have a progressive law, and then we have harm reduction on the field. With harm reduction, what we have is a quite, um, personal approach based on rela and truth relationship to people, addressing people, and creating a relation and a dialogue with them. <clears throat> this structural dialogue, from my point of view, was being missing in the last 20 years. So, step, step by step, the Portuguese government, the Portuguese officials from the state, somehow they were creating a huge bureaucratic machine that somehow was, you know, freezing uh, the work of drug policy in Portugal. Peer involvement was forgotten during this process. Um, that is not running well. <laughs> Sorry for this, so yeah, it's not running well. Sorry.
Great. Ricardo? Thank you. Um, Portugal uh, has been leading, but that should not be our motivation to move forward. Uh, our main motivation should be to do what is based on evidence and data and what is best for the people. And uh, in that sense, we need to do more. And I think that the Portuguese model has shown, and then when we look at other countries that have tried to decriminalize, that the law alone is not enough. It is part of a greater process that includes, of course, harm reduction. But we, we need to acknowledge that there are parts of the, the system that are still not where we would like them to see. Nalex on access and distribution is still not a reality uh, within the, the system as a whole. And that is something that we need to address. Um, civil society, as was mentioned here, uh, is still not perceived by the whole of the National Health Service as part of the National Health Service. It is still something completely external to, to our health system. And in that sense, it leads to uh, difficulties sometimes in terms of articulation of services and providing the care. And uh, as was mentioned, the, what people call the hard to reach population, yesterday in the policy day, we heard the, the term, the invisible population. They're real, they're out there. And they're not going to use formal care. And there is a need for us to acknowledge civil society, community-based organizations uh, as a pillar of the health system as a whole. As we acknowledge primary health care, as we acknowledge hospital care, we need to acknowledge civil society care as part of that. And that's why in the last budget in November 2019, there was a shift in terms of funding from the 80% to the 100%. There is a need now to implement the law in a way that is effective and it does not undermine the collective efforts that uh, Jean Golan has mentioned of involving the municipalities as active parts of that process. In terms of cannabis, I think that it's an important issue. I, I personally, as a member of parliament and physician, in the past was against legalization, uh, and I changed my position based on evidence and data. Because seeing many countries and states shifting in that direction, I felt that the it was my obligation as an elected representative to look at the data and to rethink my position. And by re-looking at the data from Uruguay, from the states in the US, from, and then from other models that were not as effective as in Spain with the social clubs or in the Netherlands, uh, it became very clear that the impact from an economic, social, judicial, and health perspective were all in favor of legalization with a strong regulatory framework. And in that sense, I published in the Portuguese Medical Journal an article uh, which collected all of that evidence and it ended with concrete recommendations for the Portuguese model and I presented that uh, model to the Portuguese uh, to the Social Democratic Party Congress of which I belong to and the Social Democrats which is a center-right party here in Portugal approved the motion for legalization within that framework which was a turning point within uh, I would say Portuguese politics, the Social Democrats is currently the biggest party in parliament, and to having endorsed this, this shift from being against legalization towards being in favor of legalization within this strong regulatory framework opens the door, and I agree, after the elections next October for the next political cycle to have a very serious discussion, and I, am, I, am, I, could, I could bet that we will see Portugal move in the direction of uh, legalization, using the lessons learned of what has worked and what has not worked as well in the states in the US, um, in Uruguay, and in other countries that have moved in this direction. And this is extremely important, because when we look at the dissuasion committees within the model in Portugal, 90% are related to cannabis use. If we solve this issue, we will be opening the door to rethink the whole model. And I think that is a tremendous opportunity for Portugal to perfect what 20 years ago was progressive, but now is lagging and needs to continue to move forward. And on, we've got a really sharp schedule this afternoon, um, so I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap it up.
but as I said at the beginning, we welcome you to approach the speakers one-on-one -on -one, uh, for more discussion, for better, fuller responses to questions and interviews. I'm so sorry we're out of time. Thank you so much. Thank you.